Around 11.30 p.m. on July 22, 1991, and 32-year-old Tracy Edwards is running down North 25th Street in Milwaukee. Clearly frightened, he stops two police officers and lifts his arms to reveal a pair of handcuffs around his wrists and asks for help to remove them. According to Tracy, just moments before, some weird dude had drugged him, restrained him, and threatened him with a knife. As officers handcuffed keys failed to unlock the device, Tracy agreed to accompany them to the building from where he had just escaped. At apartment 213, officers were welcomed in by a handsome 31-year-old man named Jeffrey Dahmer. He calmly agreed he was the one who placed the handcuffs on Tracy's wrist and offered to get the keys. But at the same time, Jeffrey completely left open the question of why he had tried to restrain him in the first place. Nevertheless, as Tracy had mentioned a knife, Jeffrey was asked to stay still while one of the officers entered the bedroom to retrieve the keys. There, Officer Muller indeed noticed a large knife under the bed, but he also found something else, Polaroid pictures. As he walked back to his partner, eyes fixated on the photos, he mumbled, these are for real. The photographs displayed human bodies in various stages of dismemberment. They were clearly taken in the same apartment in which the officers were now standing. When Jeffrey noticed the Polaroids, he attempted to resist the inevitable. However, he was quickly subdued by the officers. After being taken into custody, Jeffrey was willing to confess and tell his story, saying, I created this horror and it only makes sense. I do everything to put an end to it. However, nobody was ready for how twisted the story of Jeffrey Dahmer really was. Jeffrey Dahmer was born on May the 21st, 1960 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He was the firstborn son of Joyce Annette and Lionel Herbert Dahmer. Jeffrey was described as an energetic and quite happy child until the age of four, when surgery to correct a double hernia seemed to change the boy. Conditions at the Dharma household were also less than ideal for a developing child. Jeffrey's father was rarely home as he was always either studying or working, and his mother, who was a hypochondriac and attention deprived in the marriage, suffered from depression and spent most of her time in bed. As a result, Jeffrey and his younger brother David were often neglected. Still, as Jeffrey himself later said, his childhood was not filled with any great tragedies or anything. On the contrary, according to him, everything was pretty normal. However, Jeffrey did develop some weird interests from an early age, which many of us would consider far from ordinary. He became overly fascinated by dead animals. It all started innocently enough as a healthy curiosity, but over time turned into an obsession. Jeffrey was not really interested in killing the animals, but wanted to learn how they were composed. So if he found any animal carcasses in the woods, he would take them home to be examined. Of course, some parents would find this kind of behavior worrying, but since Lionel had a background in science, he encouraged Jeffrey and even showed his son how to bleach animal bones. Jeffrey would find a lot of use for these skills later in life. It is often said that by his teens, Jeffrey was a loner, disengaged and largely friendless. However, Jeffrey himself said he had a good social life with his friends in Revere High School in Bath, Ohio. Also, his teachers described him as polite and intelligent, even though his academic success was average. He was more interested in drinking, playing pranks and dissecting animals than his grades. Experimenting with alcohol is pretty normal for teenagers, but by the age of 14, Jeffrey was already a heavy drinker. When asked why he drank so much, Jeffrey answered, it is my medicine. But medicine for what? Nobody ever asked that, and Jeffrey most likely would not have told the truth anyway. His heavy drinking was meant to suppress his growing urges, both sexual and homicidal. 
Unfortunately, in the end, alcohol was not the answer to either. Going through puberty, Jeffrey realized he was homosexual. Due to the conservative values in his family, Jeffrey hid his sexuality from his parents, but he never denied it from himself. Around the same time, Jeffrey had his first sexual encounter with another man. He began having obsessive thoughts of violence and sex put together. From there, it only got worse and worse. Finally, his obsession grew so strong, he began to plan to abduct a man to satisfy these desires. But there were a couple of problems. First of all, Jeffrey still lived with his parents. And second, he did not have the nerve to actually do it. That all changed in 1978 when Jeffrey's parents divorced. As a result, both Lionel and Joyce moved out of the family home and Jeffrey was left alone in the house for most of that summer. Finally, he had an opportunity to turn fantasy into reality. He now also did not have to try to hide his drinking. And so he spent most of his time drunk and fantasizing about murder. These dark fantasies became a bloody reality on June 18, 1978, when Jeffrey was coming back from the liquor store and spotted an attractive young man hitchhiking. That man was 18-year-old Stephen Hicks, who was trying to get to Cleveland for a rock concert. Jeffrey pulled over and picked him up. And for reasons unknown, Stephen agreed to stop by Jeffrey's house for a drink first. That decision would ultimately cost him his life. The two spent time talking and drinking together at Jeffrey's house. But as Stephen had other things to do, he eventually tried to leave. Jeffrey tried to stop him, but Stephen pushed him off. As he did so, he turned his back on Dharma, who then grabbed a 10 pound dumbbell and swung it at Stephen's head, killing him instantly. Dharma almost could not believe it. Finally, he had done what he had waited for, for so long. He laid next to Stephen's body for some time before masturbating over it. When he was done, Dharma's mind drifted back to his childhood days dissecting animals. Often serial killers get rid of the bodies of their victims quite fast and they do not find pleasure in cleaning up the crime scene. But for Jeffrey, that was part of his ritual. He spent hours dismembering the young man's body before burying the remains in a crawl space under the house. Later that summer, Jeffrey dug up the remains, dissolving the flesh with acid and crushed the bones to dust. He now knew he could not only commit the act of murder, but he could also successfully dispose of the remains. He had taken his first step along a horrific path and he could not stop. He stated, once it happened the first time, it just seemed like it had control of my life from there on in. Still, it would be some time before Dharma took his next victim. His father soon moved back into the house and set about whipping his son into shape as he saw him as a lazy drunk failure. And so Lionel convinced Jeffrey to enroll at the Ohio State University. But he dropped out after one term due to his heavy drinking. Afterwards, he served as a combat medic in the US Army for two years before his alcoholism and sexual urges became a problem once again. It later came to light that Jeffrey had drugged and raped two other soldiers during his time in the army. After being honorably discharged, he was eventually sent to his grandmother's house in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1981. For years, Jeffrey tried to suppress his urges and live a normal life. He got a job in the Ambrosia Chocolate Factory and was going to church with his grandma every Sunday. Unfortunately, playing the good grandson did not last long. He would go on to commit numerous sex crimes, including masturbating in front of children and drugging and raping men at gay bathhouses. Eventually, in 1987, Dharma decided that what he was doing was still not enough. He needed more. On November the 20th, 1987, Jeffrey met a young man named Stephen Toomey at a gay bar, Club 219, and persuaded him to return to the Ambassador Hotel 
to his room. The two drank heavily, and when Jeffrey woke up the following day with no memory of the previous night's activities, Stephen was dead, clearly beaten and strangled. This time, Jeffrey panicked. But after calming down, he put Stephen's body in a large suitcase and transported it to his grandmother's basement. There, he began his ritual of dissecting the body, setting Stephen's head and genitals aside. There had been nine years between Dharma's first two victims, but from here, his victim count accelerated. He began actively seeking out young men at gay bars and luring them back to his grandmother's house with promises of parties and booze or offering them money to pose nude. In reality, they had stepped into the house of horrors. Dharma's depravity quickly began to spiral and soon drugging, raping and killing was simply not enough. Instead, he began drilling holes into the heads of his victims while they were still alive. Jeffrey would then pour hydrochloric acid or boiling water onto his victim's brain in hopes of making them his mindless sex slave. Unsurprisingly, Jeffrey's experiments were not a success. He would also keep the skulls of his victims as trophies after first taking photos of the corpses. He also started to dabble with cannibalism. In May 1990, Jeffrey moved out of his grandmother's house into an apartment that would later become infamous. Apartment 213924 North 25th Street, Milwaukee. By summer 1991, he was murdering approximately one person each week. Dharma's reign of terror could have been brought to an end sooner on the morning of May 27, 1991, when one of his victims, 14-year-old Conorak Synthesomphone, was able to run out onto the street naked and bleeding. Unfortunately, police officers who arrived at the scene believed Dharma when he told them that Conorak was his 19-year-old lover. Not wanting to get involved, the police escorted Jeffrey and the boy back home sealing a young man's fate. Hey, hi, um, this, um, I'm on 25th and State, and this is young man, he is butt naked, he has been beaten up, he is very bruised up, he can't stand, he's 34 now, he has, he is butt naked, he has no clothes on, he is really hurt, and I, you know, I ain't got no court on him, I just think him, and he needs some help on Where is he at? On 25th and State, the corner of 25th and State. Intoxicated Asian naked male <laughs> was returned to his sober, Boyfriend. <laughs> and, uh, we're Officers returned to the station unaware that they had just allowed a murder to happen. Fortunately, Tracy Edwards had more luck. On July 22nd, 1991, Jeffrey had offered him $100 to accompany him to his apartment to pose for nude photographs, drink beer, and simply keep him company. Once inside the apartment, Dharma wrestled with Tracy in an attempt to handcuff him, but he ultimately failed to cuff his wrists together. Tracy managed to punch Jeffrey in the face, kick him in the stomach, run for the door and escape. He had just saved himself from becoming Dharma's 18th victim and ended a killing spree that had started over a decade earlier. After Dharma's arrest, Searches in his apartment revealed one head in the refrigerator, three more in the freezer, preserved skulls, jars containing genitalia, and a gallery of macabre Polaroid photographs of his victims. Jeffrey did not have many other choices than to confess, so he admitted murdering 16 young men in Wisconsin and one in Ohio back in 1978. When his trial started in January 1992, one question was if he was legally insane. It's easy to see that his actions clearly showed signs of a very disturbed mind, but in the end, Dharma was found sane and fully aware that his acts were evil. Still, as his fellow serial killer, John Wayne Gacy said, I don't know the man personally, but I'll tell you this. That's a good example as to why insanity doesn't belong in the courtroom. Because if Jeffrey Dahmer doesn't meet the requirements for insanity, then I'd hate like hell to run into the guy that does. 
After two trials, one for 15 of the victims and another in Ohio for the murder of his first victim, Dahmer was given 16 life sentences plus 70 years on May the 1st, 1992. Unsurprisingly, the media was all over him, asking for interviews and the name Jeffrey Dahmer quickly became infamous. After all, he is one of the most prolific serial killers in modern history. Despite telling the court during his trial that he wanted to die, Dahmer reportedly adjusted well to prison life. He became increasingly interested in religion and became a born-again Christian, though he questioned if his continuing to live was a sin. That wouldn't be an issue he would have to worry about for long. An attempt had already been made on his life when fellow prisoner Osvaldo Duriti attempted to slit his throat with a razor blade. Dharma survived, receiving only superficial injuries. On November the 28th, 1994, there would be a different outcome, however. Dharma, along with fellow inmates and murderers Jesse Anderson and Christopher Scarver, were assigned a job cleaning the locker room in the prison gym. For a 20-minute period, the trio were left unsupervised. During this time period, Scarver used a 20-inch metal bar to bludgeon both men to death. Afterwards, he returned to his cell and informed the guards of what he had just done, telling them, God told me to do it. Jesse Anderson and Jeffrey Dahmer are dead. Dahmer's wishes were to be cremated as soon as possible after his death. However, his mother and medical researchers wanted to have his brain examined. Jeffrey's father opposed the idea and wanted to respect his son's request. In the end, the two parents went to court, where it was ruled that Dharma would be cremated with his organs intact, with his ashes then being divided between the two parents. The apartments where most of his horrendous acts were committed had also since been destroyed. And so ends the story of one of America's most heinous serial killers. We hope you've enjoyed this episode and let us know in the comments below. Do you think Dharma was crazy or just plain evil? Right then. Take care and I'll see you next time with another story that will make you say, well, I never. <laughs>